Shalom. We're continuing the study of the Hebraic background of the Gospel according to John, seeing how John's readers would have understood some of what happens. Continuing in chapter 18. When Yeshua had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where was a garden, into the which he entered, and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Yeshua oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Yeshua therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom do you see? They answered him, Yeshua of Nazareth. Yeshua said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. The garden is not named in this account, but it is named in the other Gospels, and it is what we call Gethsemane in Hebrew, Gat Shemen. Gat is a huge millstone, and Shemen is oil. This is the garden of olive trees, and there's a press, an oil press there, for pressing the oil out of the olives. It's interesting because the first battle we see with mankind is in a garden, and now this is the last battle we're going to see, and it's also in a garden. It's not clear whether the temple guard or the Roman guard, perhaps they were both there. The Romans were always on alert. They considered Judea to be a very rebellious province, and they were always concerned that they would rise up during the feast. Yeshua uses this formula, Eho ime, I am, in Hebrew, it's translated as Ani Hu. In Exodus 3.14, where God is speaking to Moses, he tells them that his name is Ehye Asher Ehye, which means, I will be that which I will be. But in the Septuagint, we see that it's translated as Eho Ime, I am, or on the one, the being. The Ani Hu appears in several places in Deuteronomy 32:39. See now that I, even I, am he, Ani Hu, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. From Isaiah 41:4, Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, Yehovah, the first, and with the last, Ani Hu, I am he. So this formula indicates that he is saying that he is God. Continuing in verse 6, As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backwards and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Yeshua of Nazareth. Yeshua answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke, of them which you gave me, have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Yeshua unto Peter, Put up your sword into the sheath. The cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink it? We've already talked about Yeshua saying that none of the ones that was given him would be lost. See that in John seventeen twelve, and John six thirty nine, and John ten twenty eight, with the Old Testament scripture references. Jeremiah twenty three four, and I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith Jehovah. We see a closer translation in the RSV that none of them shall be missing. All the ones that he has, he has maintained. Concerning his not drinking that cup or drinking that cup, we saw in his Last Supper in Luke 28, he says, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. He doesn't take the last cup at the dinner. The name Malchus comes from a Hebrew word, Malchut, which means kingdom. Continuing in verse 12, Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Yeshua and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Yeshua, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest, and went in with Yeshua into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without. 
Then went out the other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spoke unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Then said the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Are you not also one of this man's disciples? He said, I am not. So we see in Josephus that Annas and Caiaphas are well documented historically. It's interesting that Yeshua is bound. It's a parallel to Isaac being bound on the altar. And again, we're going to run into timing problems. When is all this? Did he actually take a Passover supper for the Last Supper, or did he do that the night before? Pretty much in John, it looks like he did that the night before. Verse 18, And the servants and officers stood there, who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. The high priest then asked Yeshua of his disciples and of his doctrine. Yeshua answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask them which heard me. What I have said unto them, behold, they know what I said. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Yeshua with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest so? In many Middle Eastern cultures and other cultures around the world, showing someone the palm of your hand or even the sole of your foot is considered to be a, quite a great insult, and slapping with the palm of the hand is extremely insulting. From verse 23, Yeshua answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you smite me? Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said therefore unto him, Are you not also one of his disciples? He denied it, and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did not I see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crowed. Then led they Yeshua from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early, and they themselves did not go into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. So we've already talked about there being no roosters in Jerusalem at this time period. The guards are concerned about going into a pagan area, which would, according to their interpretation, defile them. And they are afraid of being defiled, that they might not eat the Passover. So this all appears to be the day before. However, there is an offering, which is the first day of unleavened, which is called the Chagiga offering. And it must be offered by each individual. The Passover offering can be offered by anyone, and it's for the whole family. Remember, there's a lamb for a family. So not everyone has to go. So this is Edersheim's thought. Now, Edersheim is a 19th century Hungarian Jew who became a believer. He was very, very knowledgeable in all rules of Talmud, and he's written a very large tome called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. I recommend that you get it. You're not going to just sit and read it, but it's a very useful reference work. He's, he harmonizes all the Gospels, and he cites all the Talmudic references. So one thing that he has said concerning this, there would be, have been no reason to fear defilement in the morning of the Paschal service, but entrance into the Praetorium on the morning of the first Passover day, that would be the first day of unleavened, would have rendered it impossible for them to offer the Chagiga, which is also designated by the term Pesach. There are other places where that is refuted. It's not called the Pesach. But we do see this in the Talmud. If the festival of Shavuot occurs on the eve of Shabbat, Bet Shemai say the day of slaughter is after Shabbat on Sunday. This is the day on which the animals brought in honor of the pilgrim festival are slaughtered, since they maintain that the festival burnt offering is not sacrificed on the festival day itself, but on the following day, and all burnt offerings vowed by individuals are postponed to the following day. So you could apply this from Shavuot to the first day of unleavened, and that's from the Talmud. Continuing in verse 29 of chapter 18. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then said Pilate unto them, You take him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. 
that the saying of Yeshua might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into judgment hall again, and called Yeshua, and said unto him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yeshua answered him, Do you say this thing of yourself, or did others tell it to you of me? So had the Sanhedrin judged him, the correct penalty would have been stoning. But what he spoke was, I will be lifted up. In other words, he knew he would be crucified. Forty years before the destruction of the second temple, the Sanhedrin was exiled from the chamber of hewn stone and sat in the store near the temple mount. This is going to be an important date, and we're going to see a little bit more about it in a minute. The destruction of the second temple was in the year 70 AD. Forty years before, that would have been the year 30 AD. And this is the year that we're working in right now in, in the narrative. Rabbi Yitzchak Bar Avudimi says, The intent of the statement concerning the relocation of the Sanhedrin is to say that they no longer judged laws of fines. The Gemara asks, Does it enter your mind to say that they no longer judged laws of fines? It is known that the Sanhedrin would judge law of fines for hundreds of years after the destruction of the temple. Rather, he must have said that the Sanhedrin no longer judged cases of capital law. Once the Sanhedrin left the chamber of hewn stone, the court's power to judge capital offenses was nullified. So that's the year that we're talking about, 30. Some other interesting things that happened that year were documented in Yama. But during the 40 years prior to the destruction of the second temple, a lot for God did not arise in the high priest's right hand at all. So too, the strip of crimson wool that was tied to the head of the goat that was sent to Azazel did not turn white, and the westernmost lamp of the candelabrum did not burn continually. And all these were taken as very bad omens for the Jewish people. From verse 35, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you unto me. What have you done? Yeshua answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Are you a king then? Yeshua answered, You say that I am a king. To this end I was born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews, and said, said unto them, I find no fault at all in him. But you have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So this custom of the Paschal release, the pardon, is not documented anywhere except in the Gospels. We don't really know if it was true or not. The interesting thing about Barabbas' name is that in Hebrew his name is Bar Abba, and that means son of the father. So here we have Yeshua, the son of the father, and Barabbas, this robber, who is also considered to be the son of the father. Very ironic. It's interesting, Barabbas is called a robber in this account. He probably wasn't a robber. He probably was some kind of rebellion leader. But the word there in Greek, in John, is listus. And we see in Matthew twenty six fifty five in that same hour, said Yeshua to the multitudes, Are you come out against me as a thief, as a listus, with swords and staves to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you laid no hold on me. So again, we see this parallel between Yeshua and Barabbas. They're both some kind of listis, some kind of thief or robber. Until next time, Tasimata Inayim al Keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.